In this uh, video, I'm going to do a rational functions test from chapter 5 for advanced functions. And uh, it has been requested by a number of students. And I, I guess somehow when I was doing all the other chapters, I didn't do this one. So here we go. Um, it's a pretty long test. I know my students complained that they didn't have enough time to finish it. So if you're finding it long, they did too. <laughs> Okay, so number one, it says, where does the reciprocal function of f at x equals 3 minus x increase? Where does it increase? And you're given these options. Don't you just love multiple choice? So what I would do, first of all, is write what the inverse function or the reciprocal function is. So we're going to call it y equals 1 over 3 minus x. That's the reciprocal function. Now, can we make a really quick sketch of that? Of course we can. 3 minus x. So if it's 3 minus x, where's the asymptote first of all? That would be when x is equal to 3 because that's what makes the denominator 0. So I'm going to write that on here. x equals 3. And then can I find um, the uh, y-intercept? So the y-intercept happens when x is equal to 0. So that's going to be at one third. So we'll say this is one third here. Now, do we know what the horizontal asymptote is? You should know that by now. If x got really, really big, then we would be dividing by something uh, really big in the denominator. One into, divided by something really, really big is going to give you something really, really small. So as x approaches either positive or negative infinity, this is going to have an asymptote at right here at y equals 0. So that's my asymptote. So given that there's an asymptote here, this is a single root, remember, single or single asymptote. That means the function's going to go in different directions on either side of it. We have one point here. We could find another point. Let's say what, what, is, what happens when uh, x is 2. 1 over 3 minus 2 is 1 over 1, so that would be 1. So this side of the function is going to be going like this, not crossing this asymptote. This is going to approach 0. And on this side, let's pick a number, let's say 4. So 3 minus 4 is minus 1, and 1 divided by minus 1 would be minus 1. So this side of the function is going to be going like this. So remember that you're not going to cross a vertical asymptote ever. You can cross horizontal asymptotes for finite values of x. So here's a good sketch, and I want to know where is this function increasing? Well, it's increasing here. Don't say it's decreasing here because you remember you're reading from left to right, so as I go up, it's also increasing. So it's increasing everywhere except where x is equal to 3 because that's your asymptote. So you would say x is an element of real numbers, x is not equal to 3, and that gives us letter C here. We'll just circle it. Okay, the second question says, what is the range of the reciprocal function of f of x equals 10 minus x squared? So a reciprocal function, again, we're going to write it as 1 over. I'll just put it in here. So let's call it y equals 1 over 10 minus x squared squared. So 10 minus x squared, again, we want to make a little sketch. It makes life easier for you. And we do know that um, where the vertical asymptotes are would be what makes the denominator 0 here. So I would say 10 minus x squared equals 0, x squared equals 10, x equals plus or minus the root of 10. So the root of 10 is just a little past 3 here, so we'll call this one square root 3, and this one here we'll call it square root minus 3, or minus square root of 3, but not, not negative 3. Okay, there we go. Now, um, what happens when x is 0? When x is 0, we get 1 tenth, so we're right about here. Let's say it's there. And if we put in, um, this is root 3, let's see what happens when we use um, 3. So 1 over 10 minus 3 squared would be 1 over 1, which is 1. So in here we're already at 1, and 
here we'd be at minus one. So this function is going to be going like this in this zone here. Now we need to know what happens on the other sides of these asymptotes. Um, let's say we pick, uh, let's say minus five. If I put in minus five here, that would be uh, minus five squared is 25, 10 minus 25 is minus 15. So I'm at minus 1 15th. So that's going to be kind of like here. And it's going to be the same on the other side, but over here. And these asymptotes here, 10 minus x squared, this would be, um, if we broke it down, if we factored it, we'd say this is the same as 1 over 10, uh, sorry, root 3, root 10 minus x, root 10 plus x, right? So these are single roots, and so that means this one's going up, this one's going to go down. So we have the function going like this here, and it's going to go like this here. And it also has an asymptote at y equals 0. Okay, so what is the range of this function? Well, looking at the possibilities here, we know that it is uh, the range is anything less than 0. So that's this one, oh, and or this one. And we also know that we're at 1 tenth here. So it's going to be y is greater than one tenth or less than zero. And that brings us to letter D here. Okay, so for only one mark, that's a lot of work, right? I would say. Number three, identify the function represented by this graph. Okay, so let's look at some possibilities. It's obviously not either of these. That's just a parabola shifted up one or down one. This is not just a parabola. This is a reciprocal function. So now we look at these ones here. What's the difference here? What are we dealing with? So for this one, we have, um, we wouldn't have any asymptotes, right? X squared plus one, set it to zero. X squared equals negative one. Nope. So this has got to be the right answer here just by process of elimination. And that is uh, much easier than either of those first two. Number four, which of the following rational functions has a whole? So you know that in order for it to be a whole, it has to divide into the numerator. So the denominator has to divide or cancel out with this one. So if you look here, no, can't do that one, can't do that one. And they're trying to fool you here. Like, are you silly enough to think that divides into that? Absolutely not. Or this one, no, 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 no. This one, um, you're not going to take out a factor of 2x, but this one, look, if I factor this one, I take out a 2, I get an x minus 3 over x minus 3. So that means this has a whole at x equals 0, and I choose d. Number 5, state the equation of f at x if the domain is x is an element of real numbers, x is not equal to two thirds, and the y intercept is zero and one half. Okay, so let's take a look at what makes the denominator not equal to two thirds. So that means which of these has an asymptote at two thirds? So neither of these, these would be minus two thirds, so that eliminates those two. So it's either A or B, and I want a y-intercept of 0 and 1 half. So the y-intercept means set x to 0. So x to 0 for this one would give me minus a half, and x to 0 here would give me minus 1 over minus 2, which is plus a half. So my answer is b. Okay, number 6. An airplane has an airspeed of 400 kilometers with no wind. The airplane flies 2,140 kilometers with the wind. The plane can only fly 1,860 kilometers against the wind. And the whole key to this is this little phrase here, in the same time. If W equals the speed of the wind, which equation would we use to find W? Okay, so you're looking at all these and they're all kind of crazy, but we're trying to figure out when are the times equal. So remember when you're finding time, distance, distance divided by speed 
gives you time. So that's what these equations are here, right? Distance divided by the speed. Distance divided by speed. Now, which ones make sense, though? So 2140 with the wind. So that means it's going to be 400 plus the wind, right? So the first one is going to be 2140 divided by the wind plus 400 kilometers. And that has to be equal to the other um, the other distance speed equation that we'll get with this one. So it's going 1860 kilometers against the wind. So if you're going against the wind, that's going to slow you down. So it's going to be 400 minus the wind speed. So 400 minus W. So that would be this equation here, right? Question C. Okay, so there's the first six questions. Probably would have taken you more time on your own, but you know, get somebody telling me how to do it, it makes it much easier. Okay, where is that on the page here? Number seven here. State the equation of the rational function that this graph represents. Okay, so first of all, can we determine where the um, asymptotes are? Best thing to do, right? So obviously there's an asymptote here at three. X equals three. Now there's also a horizontal asymptote. And where would that be? It looks like it's about here, right? At y at um, y equals minus two. Okay, so which of these has an, a vertical asymptote at x equals three? So it's either this one or this one, right? Not these ones. These would be minus three, gone. Now, which one has a horizontal asymptote of minus two? So all you have to do is look at the um, Leading coefficients of the x terms here. So that's minus 2 over 1. This is 2 over 1. So the answer has to be A. Okay, number 8. Which inequality is equivalent to this? Okay, so in other words, we need to figure out what will we do to this. We'll have to kind of solve this. How would we rearrange this equation. So in order to set it to be greater than or less than zero, if I move this to the other side of the equation, it's going to look like this, right? I'm going to say minus 2x. I bring the 18. They both have the same denominator, so that's nice. I can put them both over x plus 5. And I have, um, I'm bringing this across here, so I'm going to add 18 over x minus 5 is less than zero. Okay, so do either of those equations look like that? Yes, this one right here. We've already figured it out. So the answer is A. Okay, now when we move that to the other side, oh, sorry, just a minute here. This was 2x minus 18. We had minus 2x plus 18. So in order for me, let's make a check here. If I um, divide by a negative 1, so let's say I've, I factored out a negative. So I do this, minus 2x minus 18 over x plus 5. And I divide the right-hand side by a negative. You know that means you have to change the direction of the inequality. So we jump the gun a little bit there. So this is 2x minus 18 over x plus 5 greater than 0. So 2x plus 18, um, we could also, well, I guess we could have factored up the 2 as well there, and that would have saved a little, a little more work here. So obviously, none of these works. So it has to be one of these ones. So if I factor out another 2 here, 2x plus 9, over x plus 5. I could have, should have done that all at once. Is greater than 0. I divide by 2 on both sides and I end up with x plus 9 over x plus 5 is greater than 0. And do we have that one? Do we have that anywhere? Um, 
I took out the minus, so that made uh, 2x minus 18. I switched the sign, and then I factored out a 2. So I don't have um, 2x plus 18, 18 plus 2x. I don't even see the one. I thought it was one of these ones here, but now I'm seeing that this is x plus 9, and they don't give me an x plus 9. Oh my goodness. If I divide by minus 2, let's go back here. I feel I made a mistake somewhere. I divided by the negative. Oh, well, I did it right here. I forgot to leave the negative in. And it's like this. And that gives me x minus 9 over x plus 5. See, even teachers make mistakes. Is greater than 0. And that gives me d. Hooray. Okay, number 9. Sketch the graphs of the following rational functions on the grids provided state vertical asymptotes, labeling them as even or odd. Okay, so for the first one here, we've got um, asymptote at x equals 0 and 2. So that's the first thing I'm going to do is make a little, I should use a color pen, but I like to do my math in pencil. And 2 is the other asymptote. x equals 2. So x equals 2, x equals 0. This is an even asymptote, and that's an odd asymptote. So in between 1 and 3, or 0 and 3, let's choose, or 1 and 2, my goodness, Let's choose 1 and see what we get. So we get 1 squared is 1, and 1 minus 2 is minus 1 squared is 1, 1, 1, 3. Okay, so when x is 1, y is 3. Okay, so we know it's not going to cross here, so it has to be going up, and it's bound by these two asymptotes. Now, on this side of the equation, this is an even asymptote. So that means this is going to be going in the same direction, right? This has to go this way on this side. And it's odd on this side because it's root 3 or to the power of 3. So we're going to be going down on this side. So let's, um, let's try a number past 2. Let's say 3. If I put in a 3 here, I'd have 3 over 27. This is just going to be 1. So 3 over 27 is 1 ninth. So that's going to bring me really close to the axis here. I do also know that I have a horizontal asymptote. As x approaches infinity, y approaches 0. So y equals 0 is my, my um, horizontal asymptote. So it's going to come down like this. And on this side, if I choose, um, let's say, minus 1. So that's going to give me negative 1 here. And negative 1 minus 2 is minus 3 squared is 9, so that's going to be times 9, and 3 over that, so that's going to be minus 1 third. And because this is an odd asymptote, this one's going down, this one's going to approach the horizontal asymptote. Okay, so state vertical asymptotes, labeling them as even or odd, I should have said odd here then, and the horizontal asymptote y equals 0. Um, the zeros, there are no zeros, no zeros, and the y-intercept, there is no y-intercept because we have an asymptote at um, x equals zero. Okay, let's go on to the next one here. It says x squared minus 4 over x squared minus 1. So if I factored that quickly, I'd have x plus 2 times x minus 2, a simple difference of squares in both the numerator and the denominator, x plus 1, x minus 1. Okay, so that's going to give me my vertical asymptotes here at minus 1 and plus 1. So we're going to say x equals 1, and this is odd. And we're going to have another one here. x equals minus 1, and that's also an odd asymptote. Okay, x-intercepts set the numerator to 0, and I get x-intercepts at plus and minus 2. So one's going to be here, and one's going to be here. 
Okay, so that means something has to be happening in the middle here. And um, can we say where the horizontal asymptote is? Well, these have the same degree. So the horizontal asymptote will be the ratio of the leading terms. So here would be 1 over 1. So that's y equals 1. Okay. So we've got y equals 1, x equals 1, x equals minus 1. What happens when x is 0? We'll put in 0 here. We'd have 4, 4 for an answer, right? Negative 4 over positive 4. So that means I have a little point here. This is going to be going up like this. A little baby parabola up there. And down here we have, um, this one's going this way. It's going to approach y equals 1. And this one's going to go down, and that fits with our odd asymptote. One up, one down. And the same thing on this side. This is going to go down, and this is going to approach the horizontal asymptote. Okay, so that's quick graphing. Okay, number 10. It says, state the horizontal or oblique asymptote for each of the following equations if they exist. Mm-hmm. Do they exist? Well, let's just take a look at them. When we have this equation here, what are the, the horizontal asymptote? So again, we have the same leading terms, or x over x, so it's going to be y equals 2. That's a nice, easy one. What about this one? Well, this is going to be your oblique, right? because remember, it has a degree 1 more than the denominator. So this is the same as me writing um, y equals 2x minus 3 over x. So I've divided each term by x. And then I would say as x approaches infinity, 3 over x or minus 3 over x approaches 0. Therefore, the oblique asymptote is y equals 2x. And there you go. Okay, what about this one? What's the horizontal asymptote or the vertical asymptote? So we're dividing by something really big here in the denominator, right? As I cube x, it's going to be make this denominator so much more bigger than the numerator that it's going to be like dividing one by a billion, right? It's just like this is so big down here. We're cubing, cubing. So that means y is going to approach zero because I'm dividing a small number by a really, really big one. And the last one here, um, x cubed, 2x cubed minus 3 over x minus 3. Now, there is no horizontal asymptote here because um, the function actually is going to look something like this. If you graphed it, um, this is so much bigger than this one that as x approaches infinity, this is going to approach infinity. And so if you see it approaches infinity, then the asymptote does not exist. So you're just going to say no horizontal asymptote. Okay, so we're moving right along here. We're already up to number 11. Number 11 asks you to sketch the graph. Let me get this paper out of the way and have a little sip of tea. I've been out hiking all day and I'm very thirsty. My tea's already cold. Sketch the graph of, let's see if we can get this on the page here. Sketch the graph of f of x equals x squared minus 2x. And use the graph to sketch the reciprocal function. Explain how you were able to do this from the graph of f of x. Include in your explanation x-intercepts, asymptotes, vertical and horizontal, increasing and decreasing intervals, minimum and maximum values. Okay, so let's get this graph sketched here, x squared minus 2x. So let's factor that first. So we've got something a little better to work with. So we have x times x minus 2. Okay, so what are my x-intercepts here? Well, they would be 0 and 2. So I'm going to draw those on here. 0 and 2. It's a parabola, so it has to be um, symmetrical about the line y equals or x equals 1 here because this is the same distance away. And remember, parabolas are symmetrical. 
So when x equals 1, what do we get? 1 times minus 1 is minus 1. So there's the vertex of my parabola. Okay, so just for another point, what happens when x is 3? So we'd have um, 3 times 1, which is 3. So I'm going to have a point here. And it's going to be the same on the other side. And so I'm just going to sketch in my parabola like this. There we go. So this is f of x equals x squared minus 2x. Okay, now how do we draw, um, let me get a color here for you. How do we draw the reciprocal function? So the first thing you remember is that Everywhere there's a zero, one over zero now becomes an asymptote. So I'm going to put in one here. That's going to be x equals two. And this is going to be the other asymptote right here. And that's going to be x equals zero. Okay, so the same thing if we if we wrote it as y equals one over x times x minus two you would know those were the um, the asymptotes vertical. Okay, as x approaches infinity, what is this going to approach? So you should say 0, because it's 1 divided by something really, really big. So I also have an asymptote here. This is going to be y equals 0. Okay, so we've got our asymptotes in, and now you should think about um, the max and minimum values. So remember that when you do a reciprocal function, the minimum becomes a maximum. So 1 over that. So right now we have minus 1, and 1 over minus 1 is just minus 1. So this is one of these um, points that is actually the same on both graphs. So sometimes... You know, you might have a minimum of minus 2, and then the maximum would be at 1 half, because it would be 1 over it, right? So this is going to be my maximum, and this is going to go down like this. Now remember that for reciprocal functions, if the function was decreasing on this interval, then it will be increasing on the reciprocal. Now think about that. That's pretty smart. Like when you, if you're decreasing then you go one over that number and that makes it, it's going to be going like that. Okay, now there's invariant points to remember those. I don't know if your teacher might have mentioned them, but if I do one over one, and one over one is still one. So wherever the height of the function is one, that would be here and here, those, gra those points are going to be on the graph of the reciprocal function. So if I look at the function here, this was increasing in this interval. So on this side, it's going to be decreasing. So I'm going to have everywhere there's a decreasing interval, you now have increasing. So this is going to be going like this because this was increasing. This is now decreasing. And from here, it's increasing. So now it's going to be decreasing. And there you go. And it's going to do the very same thing on this side of the asymptote. Okay, so I think um, I've explained what we're talking about as I've drawn this, so I'm not going to waste the time to write that all out. Okay, number 12. <clears throat> the average cost of producing a toy, where X re represents the number of toys produced per hundred, is given by this formula. Estimate the rate at which the average cost is changing at a production level of 400 toys. Okay, so this is 400 toys, and they're talking about per 100. So I want to know where when x equals 4 is what I'm looking for here. Okay, this is per 100. That's sometimes a little thing that gets mixed up and... If you had put in 400 and then you'd end up really with really bad numbers. Okay, so I want to know the average rate of change. I'm going to write it as ARC when x equals 4. When x equals 4. And I'm going to go back to my pencil now. Okay, so remember to find the average rate of change. 
the average rate of change is going to be C at, we're going to go one hundredth more. C at 4.01 minus C at 4 divided by our H here is going to be 4.01 minus 4, so that's going to be over 0 0.01. Okay, so um, didn't leave a lot of room to write this question. Hopefully I can squeeze it all in. Probably my students didn't have enough room either. Oh, I'm so mean. Okay, so I write out the equation. So minus 0 0.3 and I plug in 4.01 and I square it plus 5 times 4.01 plus 3 all over 4.01. Now that's just this part here, right? That's all I've done now. So I'm pl plugging in 4.01 to this and now I'm going to subtract plugging in C at 4. So minus 0 0.3 times 4 squared plus 5 times 4 plus 3 all over 4. And the whole shoot and match here is going to be divided by 0 0.01. Okay, so I'm not going to um, do all of the calculation here for you. But I'll tell you what the answer is. The rest, this is just plugging it into your calculator. Oh, maybe I'll write out the, the values that I got for this part. So I got um, 4.54513. I left lots of decimals. And I'm subtracting, this one came out to a nice 4.55. And I'm dividing that by 0 0.01. And I ended up with an answer of approximately minus 0 0.4. Now we're talking about money here, right? So it's 487, blah, 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 0324. So you would say, therefore, um, the average cost, average cost is changing at approximately so now you need units, right? So I'm going to say um, 0 0.49, that's your money, per 100 toys produced when 400 toys are produced. Okay, so when you're at that production level, you're gaining, um, yeah, actually it's costing you 49 I should have said negative here, or it's decreasing. I'm going to put the negative in, but usually you'd say the average cost is decreasing by 49 cents per 100 when 400 toys are produced. Okay, so we're moving right along here to number 13. It says solve 8 over x squared minus 4 equals 4 over x plus 2 for x. And the first thing you want to do is move this to the other side of the equation. Now, um, don't forget to move them because um, it's just the right way to do it. If you don't, you're going to end up with another root that isn't real uh, because it will be um, an asymptote. So I bring this to the other side, and now I want to um, find a common denominator here. So remember that x squared minus 4 is the same as, well, maybe I'll just do it like this. So this is x plus 2 times x minus 2. And this one already had an x plus 2. So in order to have the same denominator, I need to mark, multiply it by x minus 2. And I want to know where is this equal to 0. So you just expand. So I get 8 minus 4x plus 8. 8 minus 4x plus 8 over, doesn't matter what's in the denominator really, but don't forget it because that would be in proper format. When is this equal to zero? So this is equal to zero when the numerator is equal to zero. You don't worry about the denominator, right? How do I make this zero? The numerator is zero. So I would get um, minus 4x plus 16 over x plus 2x minus 2. 
is equal to zero. So I want to know what makes this equal to zero and that would happen when x equals four. And that's your solution. Okay, a couple more questions. Find all values, where is it? There we go. Find all values that make this inequality true and write your answer in interval notation. So I want to know where this little thing is greater than the other one. So let me just get my sheet up here. So we have this greater than or equal to this. So first thing, bring this to the other side, make it greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so I have x plus four, oops, I think I need a little more lead out here. x plus four over x minus three, right on the page, there we go, um, minus, now I subtract this one, right? Minus x minus five over x plus two, and I want that to be greater than or equal to zero because I've subtracted it here, I bring it over here. Okay, so now in order to solve this, I have to have a common denominator. So I'm going to make it x minus three times x plus two. So that's going to give me, I had x plus four here. I'm gonna to have to multiply that by x plus two. And I have minus, be careful with your minus signs, okay? So I have x minus five, and I'm gonna multiply that by x minus three. And that will give me the same denominator here of x minus three and x plus two. Okay, so now I wanna find, um, I wanna expand and simplify this. So that's going to give me um, x plus four over x minus three, x minus five over x plus two. Okay, so let's expand the numerator here. We have x squared plus two x plus four x is plus six x plus eight. And we have um, minus, so be careful here now. So I have x squared, x squared minus three x minus five x is minus eight x and plus 15. And still over the same denominator, x minus three, x plus two. And I want to know where is that greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so let's finish uh, simplifying this expression here. So x squared minus x squared, those are going to be gone. Plus six and minus a minus is plus, so that's 14 x. And plus 8 minus 15 is minus 7 plus 8 minus 15, right? Minus 7 over x minus 3, x plus 2. Greater than or equal to 0. Okay, now I didn't divide by any negatives. Everything is fine. So now I want to know where is, um, I want to sketch it here so I can show where it's greater than or equal to 0. So my asymptotes here, three and negative two. So I'm gonna sketch those on here. X equals negative two, X equals three. And what is my X intercept here? So I set this equal to zero and solve. That's going to give me 14 X minus seven equals zero, 14 X equals seven. So x equals seven over 14 or one half. Okay, so right here. What is my y-intercept? So set x equal to zero, so I'd have minus seven. I'm not gonna write it here. Y-intercept set x equal to zero. So that gives me minus seven over, this is gonna be minus three times plus two, so that's minus six. So that's going to be seven over six, or one in a little tiny bit right here. Okay, so we have, um, if you wanna check one more point here, I know that it's going to go like this, it's gonna come down, it's gonna go through here, and then it's gonna go down like that. How, that's how it's going to look. Because there's nothing, um, 
it has to it can't cross back over the x-axis so it has to pass through it um, you could check another point let's say uh, we put in 2 so that would give me 28 minus let's say when x equals 2 I would have 28 minus 7 over 2 minus 3 is that's minus 1 minus 1 and 2 plus 2 is 4 so that's going to give me 28 minus 7 is 21 divided by negative 4. That's going to be minus 5 and a little bit. So I'm, it should be down here a little more. But it's going this way. Okay, so that's right. Now, what about um, a horizontal asymptote? Do I have a horizontal asymptote with this equation? Absolutely, because this is x squared in the denominator. It's only x in the numerator. So that makes my horizontal asymptote y equals 0. Now you might say, oh, you crossed it. You can cross a horizontal asymptote for finite values of x, and that's why we're doing it here. Now as this approaches infinity, this has to approach 0 here. Okay. So I look at my um, denominators, and these are both single roots. So that means this is going to come down this way, like this. Now we could get a better height here by maybe plugging in 4 and see how high this is. It might be way up here somewhere. That happens sometimes, right? Um, let's just do a quick check when x equals 4. Let me just pull this down a bit for you. So when x equals 4, I would have uh, 14 times 4. That's what, 56? So I would have 56 minus 7 over... Uh, 4 minus 3 is 1, and 4 plus 2 is 6, so this all over 6. 56 minus 7, that's 49 over 6, and 6 goes into 49, 7, 8. 6, 8 are 48, so 8 and a bit. So when x is 4, this it is, it's going to be way up here somewhere, like this. It's going to come down and approach 0. And similarly, over on this in this quadrant here, and we'll just sketch it something like that. It doesn't really matter because um, you're trying to find solve the inequality. So what I want to know is where, in the end here, I want to know where is this greater than zero. So it's not greater than zero here. It's not greater than zero here. But it is greater than zero to here and over here. Okay, so I need a place to put that right here. So I'm going to say x is an element of, and we're going to write interval notation. So I need a bracket. This is a round bracket because we don't touch this. So I'm going to put minus 2. From minus 2 to this point right here, which was, oh, what did we say this point was here? I wrote it on here. Uh, the x-intercept was 1 half. So minus 2 to 1 half union right union because i have this other point to discuss here so this is three we don't count three because we're not on it three two um now this was greater than or equal to so we should have a square bracket on this one here because we are including the point one half okay so it's all of this to here and including this point if it was just greater than zero we wouldn't put that in square brackets but it is greater than or equal to. And this one is going to be um, from 3 to infinity. 3 to infinity. And there you go. Okay, so could you have done all this in one period? Now the kicker, the word problem question. It says the football boosters bought pizza for $900 to sell at the game. Wouldn't it be nice if your teacher gave you the same question? They are from a, a test bank, so possible. They kept 10 pizzas to feed the players after the game and sold the rest for 10,000 or 10,000. Woo! $1,040. Their profit was $4 per pizza. How many pizzas were in the original order and what was the original price of each pizza? Okay, so we have numbers of pizzas to deal with. So let's say let x represent the number of pizzas. Okay, so if I wrote out 
the pizzas, the price that they paid for the pizza. Okay, so how much did they pay per pizza? Well, they paid $900 and they bought X pizzas because we don't know how many they bought, right? How many pizzas were in the order? That's what we're trying to find. So 900 divided by X is going to be price per pizza. That's what they originally bought. How about the bought price? The bought price. Okay, what's the sold price? They kept 10 pizzas to feed the players after the game and sold the rest for 1040. Okay, so they made they sold this is the price sold sold price the sold price was 1040 how many pizzas did they sell well they sold 10 less than they bought right they bought x and they kept 10 so this is going to be x pizzas so let's say they bought 30 pizzas and then they kept 10 so they had 20 pizzas, and that was their sold price. Now, their profit was $4 per pizza. Okay, so that's the difference, right? If I paid if I paid $10 for them and I sold them for $15, then I made $5, or in this case, $4. So let's say this was, they paid $10 for a pizza, they sold them for $14, and their profit was $4. So that means that the sold price sold price minus the bought price is going to give me the profit. How much money did they make? What they sold them for minus what they bought them for is going to be profit. Okay, so price, price, the profit is also price. So the profit is $4. The sold price, so 1040 divided by x minus 10 minus 900 divided by x is going to be equal to, oops, big equal sign, 4. Okay, now we're all set to solve, right? All we have to do is solve this. So I need to get everything to one side of the equation and find a common denominator. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's go. So we have 1040, and we're going to divide that, we're going to make a common denominator here, of x minus 10 times x. So this had the x minus 10 under it, so I'm going to multiply this by x. And minus 900, I'm going to multiply that times x minus 10, and that's going to be equal to 4. Okay, so let's simplify this a little bit. So we have 1040x, it's going to be minus 900x. So 1040 minus 900. Mm, how many is that? 140? Oh, sometimes I don't want to trust my own judgment here. It's going to be 140. Okay, so we have 140x. And minus 900 times minus 10 is plus 900. And this is all over this, but we're going to just throw this over here and multiply 4 by this. Okay, so that's going to get rid of that denominator. So I have 4 times, let's expand this, so I have x squared minus 10x. Right, now you could have made, could have just subtracted this and made it with the same denominator but um, we're dealing this is this is just fine the way it is here so I have 140 X how many X am I going to have here minus 40 bring it over add 40 X uh, plus 900 and um, minus 4 X squared right because I brought this one over here equals zero so I'm going to I'm going to write this out and I'm going to change the sign after. So I have minus 4x squared plus 180x. 180x. Um, what did we do here? Oh, we didn't multiply this out. 140x minus 
900x was that, and minus 900 times minus 10 is 9,000, maybe. Okay, and 4x squared minus 40x. Okay, so 140x to minus 9,000 minus 4x squared equals 0. So now I have minus 4x squared plus 188x plus 9,000 is equal to 0. Okay, well, I don't know about you, but I don't like seeing this minus 4 here. So does everything divide by minus 4? Let's try that. So I get x squared. Uh, 4 into 180 is 45, right? So that's going to be minus 45x. And 9,000 has got to divide by a minus 4. Um, divide by minus 4 is going to be minus 2250 equals 0. Okay, here we go. Can you factor that? Sure you can. Okay, so how do you factor if you don't know what you're doing? <laughs> how do you factor when you know it's a really big number? You start dividing, right, by the little tiny numbers that go into everything. So 5 goes into 20, that's 4, 5, 0. And divide by 5 again, it's going to give me 90. And divide by 5 again, it's going to give me... Um, 5 goes into 9 once, 18. And then I could divide by... 3, that's going to give me 6, and divide by 3, that's going to give me 2. Okay, so now I want to find things that multiply together, um, or add to give me 75, uh, 45. So 25, 5, 25, if we do this with this one, that's going to be 50, now 25 times 3. Okay, let's do this one and this one. That's going to give me 75. And 5, 15, and 2 is 30. These three make 30. And we can make 45 out of these two. Okay, so which one's bigger? It's got to be negative 75 plus 30. So it gives me x minus 75. x plus 30 is equal to 0. Okay, so now we know how many pizzas they were sold. Can we have negative pizzas? No, we can't have negative pizzas. We had 75 pizzas. Therefore, x is equal to 75 pizzas. Maybe your teacher would want you to write here x equals 75 minus 30, and then circle this one and say inadmissible. Can't buy negative pizza. Okay, so... You bought 75 pizzas. And it says, how many pizzas were in the original order? 75. What was the original price of a pizza? Well, we, we know what the original price was. This was the bought price. So that's 900 divided by 75 is going to give us uh, 175, 152. So 75 pizzas at... $12 each. Okay, now I think the original question, um, this pizza question, talked about uh, slices of pizzas. There were eight slices in a pizza. So if you want to do that, it's better to make it into the number of pizzas to start with and then figure out, well, you'll see what I mean. If your teacher gives you the number of slices bought, and there are eight slices in a pizza, so you would divide and get how much for one pizza, and then it would make things much easier. Okay, so that was a really long take-up of a Chapter 5 test. I hope you found it helpful. I know a lot of you were asking me for this, so I hope this uh, satisfies your need for some practice, and good luck on your Chapter 5 test. Don't forget to subscribe, and hopefully see you guys also in Calculus and Vectors. Bye for now.